Hi guys, as you can probably see in the background, it is yet another absolutely gorgeous winter day in the dried up uh, wasteland paradise of South Austin, Texas. We have made it to Monday, December 24th, 2012, so this will be my Christmas Eve economic meltdown rant where as I do every Monday morning, I open up the, just go on to Yahoo News to their business finance page to take a roundup of uh, business finance, U.S. global economy stories, just business related stories that uh, where I dig around, sometimes I have to dig more deeply than others, to find stories uh, about the continuing uh, erosion, if not downright building economic collapse in this country and on this globe. Um, now, as to continue in my broken record, uh, preface to all this for those who, guys who don't know me or who haven't figured this out yet, I present the, the impending collapse of the U.S. and global economy as good news because the only way to save this planet is to bring down this economy. It is step one in saving this planet because for every quote good news story about the economy this uh, this fossil fuel soaked limitless growth uh, myth of an economic model uh, that, that is bringing this planet to its knees we need to uh, put this economy in this toilet to save this planet. I was looking at this video yesterday on YouTube. I put it on my favorite somewhere, but it showed these this classic hockey stick uh, graph that all of these hockey stick graphs from the uh, past 200 years, especially the past 50 years, all of these indicators like as the economy gets stronger, as, as more and more people pull themselves up out of poverty, as the poverty rate decreases, the, the economic GDP increases, uh, what is normally referred to as good news going exactly hand in hand with these hockey sticks is environmental uh, signs of environmental collapse. They're tied together like this. As the economy goes up, the environment goes down. So the reverse should be true of this. As the economy goes down, the environment goes up. So with that as a backdrop, I am going to bring you as I do, I pick out about a half dozen stories right here off the mainstream media uh, to see what is going on on Christmas Eve 2012 as Santa Claus loads up his sleigh. Speaking of Santa, right here from Reuters News, <clears throat> uh, I, I start off every Monday morning, of course, by looking at the stock market on Monday morning, which is you know that that's the obvious place to start so starting here with the stock market Reuters news start of Santa rally dampened by fiscal cliff worries now uh, half if not two-thirds of these stories uh, in today's business page are about the the upcoming fiscal cliff I'm so I, I am so sick and tired of hearing about the fiscal cliff. I wish we would just go over the damn fiscal cliff, get it over with, you know, and start dealing with this. Uh, you know, we need to go splat over this cliff. Anyway, I'm not gonna, Jesus, don't get me going on that. Anyway, stocks edged lower on Monday as caution over the potential for volatility 
driven by worries about the U.S. fiscal cliff, dampened enthusiasm at the start of a seasonally strong period for equities. The S&P 500 index declined 0.9% on Friday, its biggest drop in more than a month. As a Republican plan to avoid the cliff, the cliff being defined as a $600 billion in tax hikes and spending cuts that could tip the U.S. economy into recession, failed to gain any traction on Thursday night. Uh, sharp moves like that highlight how headlines from Washington can whipsaw markets, especially during the thinly traded period over the Christmas holidays. Uh, so there you go, and I guess this Santa rally, uh, what the Santa rally is, is that normally this period between now and about from today to about January 3rd, uh, historically, the stock market goes up uh, in the vast majority of years. So I will be coming at you, I guess, in two weeks to see where the Santa rally went. But this is predictions on where it's going to go, and it doesn't sound like Santa's going to rally very much. Now, guys, I'm going to put links to all of these stories in uh, so you can go read for yourself any of these stories. Uh, so, so much for Santa riding his sleigh through the, through the uh, stock market. Now, the... Uh, of course, the other thing here on the final weekend of Christmas shopping, uh, let's see how the final weekend of, of Christmas shopping <clears throat> is looking, shaping up in this country now. Remember a few weeks ago over the Black Friday weekend from Thanksgiving, that, 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 that period through there was the single strongest orgy of consumer spending in human history. Let's see how that held up uh, after, the, uh, after the initial orgy uh, wrapped up. This is uh, from the Associated Press. Subdued mood on the last holiday shopping weekend. Hallelujah. Okay, from AP, Christmas shoppers thronged malls and pounced on discounts, but apparently spent less this year. Less than what I, I, is unclear. Their spirits dampened by concerns about the economy and the aftermath of shootings and storms. <clears throat> Talk about more than just the usual job worries. Uh, talk about more than just the usual job worries to cloud the mood. Confidence among U.S. consumers dipped to its lowest point in December since July amid rising economic worries, according to a monthly index released Friday. Uh, quoting some uh, research analyst uh, saying that, according to his poll of shopping centers nationwide, he estimates that customer traffic over the last holiday weekend was in line with the same time a year ago, but that shoppers generally seem to be spending less. This is Marshall Cohen, uh, this analyst. Quote, there was this absence of joy for this holiday. There was no Christmas spirit. There have been just too many distractions. Shoppers are increasingly worried about the fiscal cliff deadline. Blah, blah, blah. Are we ever going to uh, hear the end of that shit? Uh, they're still talking about uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, all that spelled glum news for, re for retailers. 
uh, which can make up to 40% of annual sales during November and December. They were counting on the last weekend before Christmas to make up for lost dollars earlier in the season. Um, the Saturday before Christmas was expected to be the second biggest sales day behind Black Friday. Uh, but anyway, you can, you can read for yourself. Uh, they close uh, with, so then they just go interview some average American shoppers. So let's close here in the Garden, the Garden State Plaza in Paramus, New Jersey, where shopper Linda Fitzgerald said she didn't feel like shopping this season. Okay, quote, it is so hard to put yourself in the mood, uh, said the 51-year-old nurse from Yonkers who went out weekend shopping with her 17-month-old granddaughter in tow. So there you go. And uh, for, for those of you wondering, uh, just so you know, Hambone Little Tales total shopping Christmas shopping from beginning to end from Black Friday uh, right on through this weekend right on uh, through uh, tomorrow morning my total shopping bill for this year 2012 was exactly to the penny where it was for 2011 zero 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 Okay, but let's uh, switch from, uh, let's take a, a pretty big switch here and uh, over to our friends at British Petroleum at BP. Back to Reuters news. This is from Friday, this long-awaited, uh, the, the, the latest chapter in uh, the BP oil spill from 2010 as, uh, as, as BP keeps forking over the money. And this was a major, major chapter was closed uh, on Friday. U.S. judge approves settlement in BP class action suit. Okay, a U.S. judge on Friday gave final approval to BP's settlement with individuals and businesses who lost money in property in the, two, in the 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Uh, BP has estimated that it will pay $7.8 billion to settle more than 100,000 claims in this part of the class action litigation. So what this one is, is, is I understand that this is businesses, uh, individual uh, mom and pop businesses, and uh, this is the economic the direct economic damage uh, from these 100,000 claimants. So BP has settled for this class action lawsuit from local businesses, predominantly in Louisiana, uh, for $7.8 billion. This goes on top of their $4.5 billion criminal settlement so what, we're up to $12.3 billion so far that, uh, that uh, BP has settled out. Now, now understand, guys, this isn't over. Uh, I was under the, uh, the delusion that this was over, but, but I'm glad to hear it's not. So they still have uh, the, the, the medical claims has not been settled. So this is still ongoing against BP is all of these lawsuits for actual in injuries and sicknesses. Uh, all of that still left to be settled and, and there's still, I guess, thousands of, of miscellaneous civil suits 
uh, still left to be settled. So the apparently, as of now, uh, BP ha is up to over $12 billion. It has paid out to apologize for one of the biggest uh, environmental disasters in world history. And make no mistake about it, guys, this, this oil well is still leaking. It has never stopped leaking. Uh, and I, I don't know how much, I guess we will wait for these medical claims to hear how much they're paying the, uh, you know, the dolphins and the pelicans and the sea turtles and uh, all those guys. We will see how much they get from BP to apologize for their little boo-boo. Uh, but as for a, to, to stay in kind of that vein, uh, as long as we're talking about uh, hits to the energy sector, let's go over from the specific to the general. Uh, this is from a new service called Market Watch, titled, No Holiday Cheer for Energy Stocks. Okay, I probably should have talked about this when I was talking about the stock market. Uh, energy stocks did not keep up with the broader U.S. equities market this year, and there's not much hope that 2013 will be any better for these energy stocks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Energy names on the S&P 500 index have gained about 4.5% so far this year. <clears throat> but only the utilities sector performed worse, being down 1.3%. This compares with gains of nearly 30% for the top performing financial sector. So uh, these big, these too big to fail banks um, made more money investors investing in these, in these global banksters putting in 30% returns on their investment. But if you were one of these suckers and uh, investing in the energy sector, uh, you made about 4.5% uh, on your investment. Uh, quote, <clears throat> performance has been lousy this year, surprisingly so since oil prices have traded higher, said Fadel Geit, <clears throat> a managing director and analyst with Oppenheimer and Company. Quote, most investors are looking for growth, but these companies don't have any growth. There you go. Um, despite all the, <clears throat> all the commotion about a, quote, oil spring <coughs> that is expected to turn the United States into a net energy exporter in a little more than a decade, finding new oil and gas reserves remains a risky, expensive, and unpredictable business. All right. Expectations that the global economy will improve have also sapped big oil's allure. All right. Most, for, this is for you guys, uh, th 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 this is why I continue to sit on the fence of peak oil. Uh, but, but here is some, right here in the mainstream media, if you dig down into this article, uh, most major oil companies missed their production growth targets this year, often merely matching last year's output. This has prompted investors to seek more specialized alternatives within the energy sector. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so how did these, these, these oil companies fare? Okay, among the industry giants, Exxon Mobil shares gained 2.9% this year. 
Chevron gained 2.2% this year, and ConocoPhillips, I guess, was the winner at 5.3%, but all fell short of the S&P 500's uh, average 13% gain for the year. The energy sector is not exactly dazzling Wall Street. Earlier this month, Goldman Sachs downgraded Exxon to neutral from buy, B-U-I, of course. The investment bank said it expects a slowly recovering global economy to pick up the pace later in 2013. We'll... Uh, We'll see about that. Uh, so this is a long and in, involved article, which I encourage anyone who's trying to figure out, like I am, what the truth is about this peak oil. This is a good article for you to read. Uh, one area of the in, of the industry almost sure to be brighter, though, coming up and in, going into two thirds. 2013 is merger in acquisitions so there you go uh, and this, you know merger and acquisitions this is where these big oil companies are are literally buying up real estate uh, and where are they buying it up they're buying it up in the Canadian oil sands and uh, the US oil shale uh, I, I realize this, this is not a con anyway, we're going to call it U.S. oil shale and Canadian tar sands. So here we go, uh, just for anyone trying to draw the dots between uh, big oil uh, and, the global, uh, and the global corporatocracy. Uh, Canada on December 7th approved foreign acquisition of, of Nexon Incorporated by China's state-controlled <coughs> offshore oil company, and Progress Energy Resource was uh, bought out by Malaysia's state-controlled oil firm. Jesus. Uh... With that out of the way, analysts, analysts believe more deals are likely in North America. Uh, I bet. Uh, rather than pursue huge outright acquisi acquisitions, oil companies are expected to nibble on oil and gas shale acreage, eyeing western Canada's uh, tar sands, the Bakken oil formation, which straddles parts of Montana. Uh, they're looking up there in North Dakota and right here in the state of Texas. Uh, all of which have been major contributors to the boom in North American shale oil production. So uh, even though they're uh, their their growth targets were off for the year, and uh, with lackluster performance, there this is where you can look for uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, this isn't rocket science. It's going to be in the Canadian tar sands and the U.S. oil shale deposits, as big oil keeps on. Uh, yeah, see this story I, I, I kind of I kind of put in here for fun guys. This is from CNBC. I'm uh, I, I, I'm I'm making a radical jump from uh, the oil industry over here to uh, the municipal bonds market. And this is the news from there. Turmoil hits munis as cliff debate rages and uh, the reason I'm putting in putting in this one in here guys is 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 I admit uh, I, I I have no clue no clue 
what the hell the municipal bond market is. I, 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 I try to read this gobbledygook. And, 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 and you know, guys, guys, I admit I'm a dumb hippie on a rock, but I do have real estate licenses in three states in this country. Uh, and, and I can actually talk all of this, this real estate finance gobbledygook and actually know what I'm talking about. And uh, uh, a little bit, I have a little bit of knowledge in the stock market, although I've, I've, I've never bought a piece of stock in my life. But uh, this whole bond market, these munis, these treasuries, these T-bills, I don't know what the hell any of this means. But uh, if someone who understands this gobbledygook says the market is in turmoil, I, I, I'm going to leave it to them. <clears throat> debate over potential fires, oh, I'm sorry, debate over potential fixes for the fiscal cliff has thrown the municipal bond market into turmoil. Into turmoil. All right, this is somebody, uh, Alexandra Lebenthal, CEO of Lebenthal & Company, speaking to CNBC just this morning. And, and this is, and, and I'm going to read you this lengthy quote from, Ale, from Alexandra Lebenthal. And uh, <clears throat> I have no clue, no clue what this shit means. Uh, but here you go, quote, What has happened is that the latest round of proposals not only had this 28% cap on deductions, which would include munis, but it would be all retroactive. It's throwing the market into real turmoil, she said, noting that muni yields have risen about 39 basis points in recent weeks compared with a 29 basis point rise in treasury <coughs> yields. She said that brokerage firms have been telling investors to sell all fixed income securities after the huge gains they've had this year to avoid much higher capital gains tax next year. This has added to the downward pressure on muni, pond, muni bond prices. There you go. And this goes on more and more. You can read this article yourself and, and, and see if you have any clue what any of this gobbledygook means. Uh, it is Greek to me, guys, but I'll trust this woman that the bond market is in turmoil while the stock market is just flat. All right, but this, in, this next article is an article that, that I certainly can understand uh, because it's not rocket science. And this, I will close my rant with this uh, story also from Market Watch. Avalanche of boomers may bury Social Security. Uh, this is a long involved article uh, with, uh, you know, analyzing all of this new data from the U.S. Census Bureau talking about all these baby boomers, uh, you know, getting ready to hit 65. That right now, every day, there are 10,000, 10,000 baby boomers hitting 65 years old, uh, you know, depending on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all of these safety nets to save their asses when there's fewer and fewer people coming up behind us to cover this for us. And uh, guys, you know, this doesn't take a, a, a rocket science. So they break down 
uh, all of these uh, all of these new uh, census bureau figures that you can read for your self uh, to come up with a voila a crisis brewing for Social Security and Medicare. This is Timothy Harris. Uh, he's the author of a book called Living to 100 and Beyond. Had this to make of, of these. Quote, we have seen the economic and social turmoil in Europe where countries have promised more to their populations than they can deliver. As I was doing research for my book, I kept wondering how European countries were able to afford these retirement and health programs that they have on their books. Apparently, they weren't able to afford this. And in the US, he said, we're starting to grapple with the same impact of our own aging population on state and municipal retirement programs and we have yet to face the impacts of these demographic changes on social security and medicare quote politicians have a short-term focus the next election and the voters that elect them are aging there you go. Given that short-term, given that short-term focus and an aging electric, electric, electorate, we are headed for gradually increasing crises in these programs. And uh, then he goes from there to the much more, the much larger, and and the obvious uh, impact of of these growing populations and the strain on uh, the Earth's resources to provide not not just here for the baby boomers in America, but for this entire planet. And, you know, he takes the the next jump, which is a good place for. <clears throat> the, the most important part of this whole rant is what I will close out with. <clears throat> Harris also said projections such as those from the Census Bureau fail to consider the impact of limited resources on long-term population growth. <clears throat> he noted, for instance, that he's the... Uh, the member of a committee of the social society, the, the committee of the Society of Actuaries, and they're and they're looking at not just population growth and democrat demographic changes, but also the resources needed to support future populations and what our country and the world must do in order to manage these limited resources. His advice, though it might sound trite, for those struggling to make sense of a world with limited resources with this, and, and this is for the tiny few of us, uh, e even understanding the impending crash between overpopulation and overconsumption, his advice to the tiny few of us out there, his tried advice, quote, think long term and plan for the future. There you go. All right. Uh... Let's see. Uh, anyway, this is this is a very long-term, uh, long-term look. A very good article. I strive you if you click on any of the links, click on the link to Avalanche of Boomers burying Social Security and Medicare. The guys, the the Avalanche of Boomers is, is just one. Is just a tiny little uh, snapshot. It is the avalanche, the avalanche of, of, of more and more people buying more and more stuff. The population hockey stick, 
the GDP hockey stick, all of these hockey sticks, uh, the, these, the, these upward avalanches are gonna go right down the avalanche on the other side. This guy understands it. This dumb hippie on a rock understands it. And uh, we're all gonna understand it when this hockey stick curve goes from the upswing to the crash. And I will be reporting on that to you from this rock as, uh, as I chronicle the, the peak of the hockey stick. But for now, I guess I'll wrap up my Monday morning economic meltdown rant and uh, I know there's two words I'm supposed to say to you, but I can't remember what they are on December 24th. So like every other Monday morning, I will say bye guys.